So I thought we'd have a little look at safe isolation and this is all about the super odd survey. If you've not heard of that before, it's a call out to industry to feedback our views, opinions, observations of what's going out on site. Share that back in this survey format and then it is distributed around industry for everyone to see what's going on from the brands and bodies down to the coalface workforce. And there is some epic giveaways that you can enter as part of that super rod of put forward kit worth about £500 or so that everyone who completes the survey is entered into a raffle prize draw. I've got a separate little giveaway to try and encourage people to get involved. It's this Nipex bag, some Nipex tools, TIS stuff, safe isolation kit. I'll run through this at the end of the video. But basically to enter that, you just need to tag me in a post on social media of a screenshot of you completing the survey. So the, the page that comes up, once you've completed it, tag me in a post with that and you will go into a raffle to win that as well. And that is worth around sort of 300 quid or so, I think. Um, but we'll have a look at that at the end of this video. First up, I wanted to run through a process of safe isolation and talk about some of the things that are maybe a little bit different, how we've traditionally dealt with a safe isolation process. And it resonates around this from electrical safety first. So this is the safe isolation procedure flow chart that they've jazzed up. I think it looks absolutely brilliant. It's uh, an improvement on the best practice guide two layout, easier to follow, a lot nicer colors, and all the contributing organizations you can see at the bottom. So we're gonna base this video around that. Those of you watching on YouTube will be able to see this in a much wider angle. So you'll get all of this in shot. Those of you who are watching in portrait on social media, you may have to bear with me a little bit where I may drop in and out of shot. Um, but first up, if we start at the top, it's telling us to ask for permission to isolate from an appropriate person. So if you're working in an office, for example, and you need to isolate the lights, but there's no natural lighting, you've got considerations with all of that, and you need to seek approval and permission from the person who is responsible on site. Um, that could be the office manager, it could be a caretaker, it could be a site electrician, whoever that may be, you need approval to carry out your isolation. So always get that. If you get a decision that's yes, then you can carry on. If you get a decision that's no, rearrange another time. We've got permission, so we need to locate and identify the circuit and isolation device. And this is where it gets a little bit more complex now with um, whole home backup in particular, and even at a commercial level now, there's UPS systems and other things that come into play if you are to carry out an isolation on an entire supply. So if we're just wanting to isolate this socket, for example, we've got a protective device in this consumer unit that is double pearl, so we could isolate the circuit from there, lock it out, and we're not isolating the whole installation to carry out some maintenance on this socket. If we were to isolate this main switch here, which takes the supply out to the entire installation, um, we do have some other considerations because we've got a gateway here, which allows for whole home backup. So if we've got a solar PV inverter or battery storage unit running as well, just isolating the main supply coming into this gateway doesn't necessarily remove all of the voltages because the batteries and the solar PV can keep running and feed those voltages back into here. So we need to be making sure that we're looking at all the different places to isolate equipment to ensure we end up with no voltage in here. And that would be from the AC isolator for our battery storage unit, an AC isolator for the solar PV, and then the DC strings isolator. So the solar strings coming down to your PV inverter, isolate those as well. Uh, most inverters, when you take the AC, AC away, shut down anyway, they're not gonna put any voltages back through to the gateway, but just to cover off every aspect, you can do that as well. And if you're doing some maintenance on an inverter, for example, you can isolate the DC feeds coming into it. You can isolate the AC feeds coming into it and then you can carry out that work activity safely with no voltages present. Super duper important. In this particular application, we're gonna keep it simple. There's no battery storage connected into this. There's no solar PV. Um, we've got the gear here to demonstrate on this board because this is the rig that goes out to the trade shows. So installer show, elect shows, where we're demonstrating and talking about some of these things in a face-to-face kind of setup, um, but they're not here. So in isolating this point here, we take the grid energy away from the gateway and we're left with a safe state to open this up. So we're gonna open this and work safely inside of here. Our isolation point is this meter tails isolator here. So we're, we're isolating it in a safe place to have no voltages present inside here. We now need to check the um, condition of the approved voltage indicator improving unit, um, which is basically making sure our equipment is suitable to carry out the work. Um, it also says here to your isolation device. So just to mention that that is the main tail switch there. I might've forgotten that. I think I, I think I maybe did. So I'm just mentioning that again, but we're gonna move on now to check the condition of the approved voltage indicator and the proving unit. In this case, I have got the TIS 
859, which is my um, favorite voltage indicator. We'll talk about why in a minute. And the TIS proving unit. So this one I like because it's got the retractable tips. You can take the fatter ends off on these. I didn't know this when I first got it. Uh, I had to speak to the people at TIS to, to learn that they do screw off and you're left with a much smaller tip. But I like them because they're retractable. There's no exposed probes on there at any stage when you're inserting into a terminal. So they're my go-to um, if we're working on AC systems. There is the, the TIS, um, I think it's the 5,000, this one here. No, 8,000, sorry which does both DC and AC. And again, you just need to make sure you get your GS38 probes on the end of there if you were using that in that application. So now we've got our um, voltage indicator and proving unit. We need to check the condition of them. So we're checking the leads, the terminals all look fine. The shrouds are in place. There's no cracks or damage. Your leads for things like this have different colors of insulation through them. If you start to see an inner color poking through, I think some use yellow, some use orange. Uh, if you're seeing that, your leads need to be replaced. They're not safe to continue. You need to get your proving unit out. These often get um, bashed and banged, which is why this nice case from TIS comes in useful, but we're just checking there's no damage on there. There's no cracks, doesn't rattle, and it's in good working order. I'll keep it out of the pouch to demonstrate in the video. It's just easier to hold and, and talk at the same time. So we'll do that. Uh, we're happy now that these are okay. So we need to check the approved voltage indicator is working on a proving unit or known live source. The live source, well, it actually says our inbuilt test function as well. Live source left in there for you working on voltages that are outside the range of a proving unit. Um, and sometimes there's applications where that is still gonna need to be used. But in this, on a typical, you know, up to 400 volts kind of setup, absolutely fine to use a proving unit. I wouldn't want to expose myself to live working to prove an instrument when I can prove it in an entirely safe way with a proving unit. So we're going to do that. Um, I'm just going to pop the probes in, nice and simple, and check we get a measurement. If I hold that up the other way around, you can see we're getting 870 volts. It's illuminating, it's vibrating. This one does vibration, illumination, and audible turns, depending on how you set it. Um, so we've got that, we've proved it's working. So we now need to switch off the circuit using a, an appropriate safe isolation device. Um, so we're going to switch off this main tail switch. So we switch that off, and in theory, that should have isolated the electrical energy into here. We've not proved it yet, but that should be what's happened. So we switched off the circuit using an appropriate isolation device, which this is. It's isolating both line and neutral into this enclosure. So we now need to secure the isolation with a suitable lock and post a warning notice and retain the key. Now, there's different things you can use for all of these depending on the isolation you're carrying out. So before we do it, I'll just show you some of the options. If you're isolating whoops, a few circuit breakers, for example, on a big distribution board, you've got this kind of option. Now you may have a few rotary isolators that you wanna go through all together. Save you applying lots of different locks. It's a steel rope, you can use that. And again, you can put a few locks through it. So if you are the electrician working on the system, but there's also um, a site maintenance management electrician or whatever, they can put their lock on it as well. And nothing gets re-energized until everybody is happy. So there's those. You've got these big ones for your big MCC CBs and such. You've got your HASPs. Again, same sort of principle. If there's a few people who need to have control of the isolation, using these is a good way to do it because you can pop multiple locks through. Um, different options on these across the board. So there's that as well. In this particular case, I'm gonna use a simple toggle, and if I can find the lock that I just had, I don't know where I put it now, go for this one. I'm gonna use a simple toggle, which goes over the um, terminals, sorry, over the, the switch lever in here. And that locks into position and prevents it from being turned back on. Now with these, you've got the, you can put it on the line and neutral, it's semant semantics, whichever one you use, um, but I just put it on the live just because it makes more sense to me. Uh, so we've popped that in there now, but it's still not secure because somebody could come along and take that off. So we need to put our lock on, and this has also got some signage on it too. We'll pop our lock on, take the key away, make sure that's locked, and the key goes in my pocket. Don't leave it on top of anything in the work area. Keep it on your person so it's secure. Now, the warning notice can form different different options. Um, we've got some of these where you can put your phone number on, the company details, the date and time, who it's been isolated by. Um, there is, there is um, 
little stand you can put in that says an isolation. There's a sheet that you can put up, it's isolation in place, don't re-energize. And we've got these tag cards here as well, which is a danger do not operate. You can put your photograph on there so people know what you look like. It serves two purposes. One is they might not want to uh, electrocute you once they've seen you. And the other is if they're trying to find you on site to ask about the isolation, you know, they get a good idea of what you look like. And all your contact details go on there as well. So that's a good way of giving people a fighting chance of finding you rather than just coming along and trying to yank off your isolations. Um, we now need to verify that the circuit equipment is isolated and dead. So we can now open up our equipment. Now, we, usually I would say to ensure while you're going through this step that you're, you're entering into what could be potentially live working. So get your gloves on. Um, you can put some goggles on if you want, depending on the kind of incident energy that's in front of you, you may need to have an arc flash suit on. It depends. Here, um, this is just a test board that is on wheels with no power going into it at all, unless it's de developed the ability to create it from nothing. So I'm, I'm gonna, I know that I'm safe anyway, so I'm just gonna go in barehanded because it's easier controlling the cameras and stuff. If we pop these out now, again, there's a little screw terminal on the side there that I've pre-loosened, so it was, would be accessed by use of a tool. We can now see all of the live terminals, but we know they could still be live. We've not proved that they're not. So we need our voltage indicator again. And you can see on this sheet here, for a single circuit, they've got a little um, set routine here that you can follow, and also for a three phase one. And I like this because it lays it out. It says here, this note, um, this limits the possible live contact, i.e. if the probe is placed on the line terminal first, then the other probe could potentially be live. So it depends on the instrument you're using, but if you was to say probe onto this live first, the other end you're wafting around could have a voltage on it, which might cause you a problem. So they're saying here that we need to go on neutral and then onto the, the line. So this is our grid in on the gateway and there is no voltage there. We then need to come off those and go onto our earth and then onto the line. And again, there's no voltage there. And we then need to go onto our neutral and the earth as we can do there, and there's no voltage there as well. So we've got zero volts measured. Now in the gateway setup with this, you could have voltages coming back in through the all-in-one and the PV generation. So you do need to make sure you also carry out your isolations away from there, and you can repeat that process on the load terminals here, um, because the electronics and the way these are all connected back through into the grid you know, they're not always in a mechanically connected state. There's relays and such at play. So you'd want to be checking those on the, the load terminals. But as we know, that's not in play here, just to mention. So we now need to go on to um, the next step. So we've done zero volts. We now need to re reprove our voltage indicator on a proven unit or the known live source. So we're going to check it again, basically. So we get our proven unit, pop it back on, and we want to see that this is still measuring voltage. So we know in the time frame that we've carried out our work. So when we first proved this, it hasn't gone faulty, measured zero volts when there's actually voltage still there. Um, there's some other aspects to check with all of this that I've mentioned before in other content and the regulations and guidance documents that are out in industry are starting to cover it as well. And they have been doing for a while actually, Guidance Note 3 has had stuff in about that um, since the 18th edition first came forward, I think. And they're talking about diverted neutral currents or neutral current diversion, however they want to term it now. And you're basically looking at um, if the neutral's gone down in the pen, a lot of the return current in a working system can end up going through the earthing system. So your water bonds, your gas bonds, and all those good PME earth rods and things, they can take that current and bring it through the earth. So you could have, um, when you dismantle this system, so say for example, we were taking the main earth out of this gateway, you could end up with a potential between that and all of the bonds, which might also be wired into the gateway or a consumer unit. So a good way to check is using a contact voltage indicator, always contact rather than non-contact, and test its working with a little button on it and just probe on to the metal parts. So onto the air thing, you can put it on the gas pipes, your water pipes, uh, the metal consumer units and distribution boards and just see if there is any voltages present. This will tell you if there is. It measures from 50 to 600 volts. Um, you can also do it with the TIS-859. You can use the little Wonder probe here and probe on, and it works as a contact voltage indicator. 
as well. So there's, there's loads of different ways you can do that. It's just something to start thinking about um, around your isolations. And uh, yeah, we're now in a safe state to begin work. We know that is isolated and we can swap this gateway if that's what we're coming here to do or change one of these protective devices out um, and then reverse the process to re-energize it. So I hope that's been useful. I did say at the start of the video, I'd run through what's in my little giveaway. So we'll do that now. Um, so this is the Nipex bag, over shoulder bag, really good quality, proper decent. And we've also got the TIS uh, B kit, which has got all your tags and lock off toggles and stuff for carrying out safe isolation. We have got the um, TIS 850, which is a voltage and continuity tester, brand new. We have got a TIS-934 uh, non-contact voltage detector, so your pen detector. We've got a proving unit, as you've just seen me demonstrating on the video. So uh, They're always a bit of an expense, but TIS, to be fair to them, have the best value kit you can get for your isolations. We've got the TIS-1000, which is your little socket tester that you can pop into a socket front and it'll tell you if you've got polarity right and such. We have got the bag for the proving unit and your voltage indicator. We have also got a Nipex Ergo strip. These are brilliant for your tails, so stripping these. Uh, also your flex cables, coaxes and stuff, cat cables, you can strip all of those with that, absolutely brilliant. We've got the, um, I think these are five in one or six in ones, I always get it mixed up, but the Nipex long nose pliers that will strip your 2.5, 1.5 crimp and crop. So they're brilliant as well, I love those. And lastly, I think it's lastly, we've got some Nipex snips that the tag's dropped off. Um, so new set of snips from Nipex side cutters. So that is all in that kit. And as I say, all you've got to do, there'll be a link alongside this video to go off and complete the Superod server. I think there's only two or three weeks left now. Please do go and get involved. There is also the giveaway from Superod that they've put together very generously for everyone who enters to go into the raffle. There is loads of other content and videos around safe isolation all over the internet from industry brands and bodies. There's the likes of Gary Hayes and eFix with their awesome content. Um, there's loads of it absolutely everywhere. I've got stuff on my channel which goes into this in a bit more detail and talks about some of this stuff a bit more in depth. And if you are at the trade shows, I think the next one coming up is Coventry Elex. We've got free stand space there for you to come along and interact with this board if you wish that I've built and put together and um, we can run through different types of isolations for if there is solar PV and battery storage. So please do come along and see us at those events. And otherwise, I hope you have a great weekend and um, keep on trucking, stay safe, don't be working live. If you've not seen Michael's story from Louise Adamson, if you're still thinking of going to work without carrying out isolations, go and watch that. Catch you all later.